Mr. Paul Reed Smith. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Paul. I can't stand talking down at people. So, no, I, I, I'm going to be doing everything from the floor. I'm going to be on the floor with you, y'all. The first thing I want to do is show you a good sounding guitar. I want to give everybody takeaways about how you can buy guitars without enough experience in the guitar making world to know the difference between a good one and a bad one. There are some ways to know. There are, do you play guitar? Yeah, but I was talking to her. Now I'm warning you, anybody asks a question is a, is a target. He plays guitar, you don't. I'm going to teach you how to buy a good guitar for him. <laughs> oh, for her. That's good. We like you already, better than him. That's, that's, that's clear. Let me show you a good sounding guitar now. It turns out that a single coil pickup does not sound like a single coil because it's single coil. And a humbucking does not sound like a humbucking pickup because it's humbucking. It's for a different reason. And I have been living this entire life to how do I get a humbucking to sound like a single coil and how do you get a single coil to less be less ice picky and sound more like a humbucking and I'm learning and learning and I'm going to show you where we're headed now I can prove that it's not that way if you play a jazz bass there are two single coil pickups in it in humbucking but it sounds like a single coil on a p bass there are two single coils in humbucking but it sounds like a single coil if you can't turn on a silver sky the middle on the treble pickup there's two single coils on in humbucking, and they all sound like single coils. It is not because it's not in humbucking. It's because for another reason. And we figured out what that was. So I'm going to show you. Now, I'm not going to play it distorted because that doesn't teach anybody anything, really. I'm going to play it dead clean. Blindfold test, would you think that was a single coil or humbucker? Somewhere in the middle. It doesn't sound like a humbucker to me. It's got much more of a single coil tone to it. To me, that's where my company is headed. Now the treble pickup. I think that's a good sounding guitar. One of the reasons that PAFs are so famous, and those are pickups in old Gibson guitars, is they sound like single coils. These old PAF pickups sound like single coils. And to me, the more that I investigate this humbucking versus single coil thing, the more that I want to take the best parts of both and put them in the guitars. The other thing about that guitar is that as I was hitting a note, the note wasn't dying. Did you notice that it was just sustaining even though I didn't have a compressor on? Did you hear that? Okay. So let me explain what that is. A good guitar will ring about 45 seconds. A bad guitar rings about 12 seconds. You can time it with a stopwatch. If you, if you exaggerate things, you can get a beginning and an understanding of it. If you put a rubber bridge and a rubber nut, for, for those that don't play guitar, this part up here and this part down here. If you put it made out of rubber, it's going to deaden the string, correct? It's going to make it not ring. And the string will ring about five seconds. So the guitar is either shutting down the string or allowing it to ring. The string wants to go nuts. You can take a really good guitar and a bad guitar and switch the strings. It's still a really good and a bad guitar. The string is trying to do its job. The guitar is shutting it down. A really trebly guitar is really trebly because something turned the bass and the mid-range off. A really bassy guitar is really bassy because something turned the mid-range and the treble off. So it's not the way you really think. It's more subtractive. The string's trying to go nuts, and the guitar is shutting it down. And the, the lesser amount that the guitar shuts the string down, the better the guitar is. I'm at Chicago Music Exchange, which is a museum store in Chicago. And 
this, and I was talking about old Les Pauls and old Strats and this theory, and this guy gets up in the middle of the room right about where you are. He goes, all right, hot shot. I said, what? He goes, we think an old Les Paul is a reissue. We think an old Strat is a reissue. We've never played a, re played a real one. We don't know what you're talking about. And I went, oh, no, I've been playing these old guitars my whole life, and that's been my thing. And he's never touched one. But they were hanging on the wall behind me. So I, I said, they're hanging on the wall behind me. You can play them. And I looked at the owner, David Colton. I said, he can play them right. And David goes, no. <laughs> and I realized, and see, so all right, get out a stopwatch, hot shot. Get an old Strat, get a new Strat. Get an old Les Paul, get a new Les Paul. Get your guitar out and get out a stopwatch and start testing in front of us all. We get them out, and the old Les Paul rings about 17 seconds. I mean, the old Les Paul rings about 45 seconds. By the way, I broke out in a cold sweat the minute he challenged me, because I had never timed my guitar. The old Les Paul rang about 45 seconds. The new one rang about 17 seconds. The old Strat rang about 47, 48 seconds. The new one rang about 17 or 18 seconds, and the PRS uh, lasted 48 seconds, so I it was okay. It was one just like that Paul's guitar right there. I always bring prototypes with me. We sold one of these today. You could have had it. Where's your credit card? <laughs> Hold on a minute. You're, you're, you're a target. I'm coming after your ass. Hold on a minute. So what is your name? What is your name? What? George with a G, not with a J. Not Jorge. Oh, there were three of those I signed guitars for today. That's why I'm asking. I spent Joe wrong once, and she yelled at me for over an hour. So I checked the spelling of everything. So what was your question? Okay, that w that's a prototype of a Paul's guitar. I think it sounds remarkable. I always bring the new stuff. Why, why would you want to come here and, and not me give you a view of the future, right? How many PRSs do you own? Um, I got three wood libraries. I got a modern eagle. You know how I can tell? You smell of it. <laughs> Why? I smell broke, right? <laughs> oh, no. Let's put your arm out and mine. No, wrong arm. No, no, no. Put your arm out. Put your Now, other arm. Now, who looks broke? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, we just have to look at our wrists and we know who's, not, who's broke and who's not broke. So you're a gear slut. You like collecting really good gear. My wife looks at me while I'm eBay. She goes, are you slutting? <laughs> your, your guy in the shop said the same thing. Yeah. Gear slutting well, it used to be called gear sluts, but they had to change it to the gear page or something, which is just so weak. <laughs> Why are you asking me what guitar that is? We can make you one of those in private stock all day long. Um, just because I want to see the perspective against those guitars. Right? Like, the wood libraries I have are yeah. Well, we all have Rosewood Nets, and uh, a couple have a 5708s. Yeah. And the other one has a 5908. Yeah, but I'm talking about the acoustic sound of the guitar, not the electric oh, sound of the guitar. Really really so you're happy. happy. Well, yeah. that's a PRS. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of guitar is that? It's a PRS. Yes. Very good. So let's ex so let's exaggerate this one more time. You have to trust your experience. If you when I was a kid. There were eight brands of guitars, seven brands. Now there's 350 brands. How are you supposed to swim through that mess? And I'm telling you, you trust your experience. If you like the way it plays, that's a good sign. If you like the way it sounds, that's a good sign. Get out a stopwatch and time it without an amp. That's a really good sign. A guitar that rings for 15 seconds is not as good as a guitar that rings for 45 seconds, period. It's over, end of story, it's easy to tell. And the reason is because the one that rings 45 seconds is not shutting the string down, and the one that rings 15 seconds, the guitar is shutting the string down, and no matter what pedal you buy, it ain't gonna fix the problem. Do you guys know, does, do you know that all these people are addicted to heroin, they buy pedals, do you know about this? <laughs> Another pedal. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what happened during COVID? Guitars were the oxycotton of COVID. If you went home and told your boss you were working, you were sitting on a couch playing the guitar. The first takeaway is trust your ears. 
when I was playing the guitar, trust your ears. If you like it, you like it. If you don't like it, you don't like it. If you kind of like it, you kind of like it. Trust your experience. That's the first thing. Second thing, time them. That really works. Third, if you don't like the way it plays, a pedal isn't going to fix it. If you don't like the way it stays in tune, a pedal isn't going to fix it. That isn't going to work. So you need to trust your experience with the guitars. David Grissom doesn't bring one of his guitars with him because he's holding our hands to the fire that we did a good enough job that we, what we shipped was what he wanted. So it's really, really, really important. I was in Tokyo when Smooth was big. And I was stunned. It was the sound of the city. Everywhere you walk, Smooth was coming out of all the shops. And it was extraordinary. And I thought that that was really cool. Look, we weren't around when, you know, uh, Stairway to Heaven was written and played, you know. We weren't around for that stuff. So in a way, we're playing catch-up. But that moment was huge. I had been to Japan 10 years earlier, and there was a picture of um, Jaco Pastors, literally the size of a building in Ginza. You know, he was so famous in Japan. I saw Orianthi walk out on the stage in Japan when she was the biggest guitar player in Japan, and the audience gasped like they couldn't believe their eyes. You, you, David, I don't know how many people are going to see David play today, but you got one of the best guitar players on the planet here. And watching him play in Joe Ely's band was a kind of a moment like that for me. Liberty Lunch, li, Liberty Lunch, what's something? Ely at Liberty Lunch is unbelievable. I could point to a pile of things, but walking around the streets of Tokyo when the sound of Tokyo was smooth was extraordinary for me. Let's look at John Mayer for just a second. He's got a boat of guitars. He's out with the dead. Which guitar is he going to go for? He's going to go for the guitar that makes him sound more like Jerry Garcia than anybody, anything else, and makes him happier. He does not care. He cares about his relationship with me, but he cares way more about producing the music that he was hired to do. It's extraordinary to watch. And for me, my goal is he's happy. When Carlos Santana's playing a guitar on the Grammys, I want the string to not break. I want it to stay in tune. You know, I'm sorry. I want, it's a tool to do a job and it better be doing a job. He comes to the factory all the time, takes a guitar, puts it in the limo, drives to the gig, gives it to the tech, the tech tunes it up, hands it to him, and he's playing for 20,000 people. The guitar hasn't been played more than a minute in its entire life, and it's got to hang. It's scary shit to watch this happen, okay? But it's good. It's really good. So what do I want? I want happy musicians. It's the only thing I want. I want to be the guitar they go for in the boat. They're number one. And if I haven't done that, I haven't done my job. You're going to try to get me to modify guitars at a clinic. <laughs> Who else has got a question? <laughs> Hang on Seriously, you're, you're not really going to do this. You're a good guy. You're a good guy. Full humbucker, both humbuckers, neck humbucker, parallel outer coils, serious inner coils, parallel inner coils. That's cool as shit. This conversation's over. All right. So, so time out. I'd like to try it through an amp. Now, now you're going to learn who I am. I don't care about that. I care that if I do that, do I get a better sound than I normally get? What I care about is the experience of the musician. The reason you did that is so you could school me at this oh, clinic. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, we are. I, I tell you, what, look at, they're all high five. We got Paul, he's down. Look, he's down. <laughs> In a Neve console, you have inductor EQs, okay? And as you turn the knobs, it'll go, it's almost like a wah wah pedal, and you can change it. Same thing on the console he's got back out here, okay? He can change the note. But if this is being done digitally, and in the old days, they did it with capacitors and inductors, okay? You can change the tone, or just like you can with your mouth, right? You're changing the resonant of the note. Pickups are quasi-parametric equalizers. You can control how loud the note is and what the cue is and the volume of it and the frequency of it. Now, I can prove it. If you listen to the sound of a Strat, that sound that you hear when they're playing on the bass pickup is in every note they play. No matter what note they play, that note, that, that EQ is in there. And, and to me, 
that's what, to, that's what TCI stands for. We figured out how to tune the inductance and the capacitance to get exactly the right note we want, the width of the note we want, and then the volume of the note we want. If the, if the volume of the note is 16 dB, which is what it is in some bad Strat pickups, it's so loud, that ice pick note is in every note you play. Wouldn't it be better if it was more like 12 dB so it wasn't such an ice pick? In terms of its volume, you're talking about a parametric equalizer. But that's exactly what a pickup is. It also has about a thousand other attributes that I won't get into, but we started to tune it. Those pickups I'm playing for you are tuned. They're exactly tuned to the note that we want them to be. And we get a screen on every single pickup that we make. Can I see the screen? Can I see the screen? We have a way of measuring it and having a, a printout of it. So it's done halfway between ears and science. In my world, I'm trying to get the neck to be straight and not warp and have the thing be as strong as it can. And when you get the water out of the wood and you get the resins crystallized, they'll pretty much ring pretty well. So to me, I'm trying to get it to ring. Once I get it to ring and it's strong enough and it's stable enough, I let God do the rest of it. But you can decide if you put a, an F hole in the guitar, there's a cavity. That note of that cavity is in every note that you play. There, it's a it's a big equation. It's a complicated equation. I actually like the way um, semi hollow guitars sound because they add this beautiful note to everything. An SG, which is a really thin piece of mahogany, has a different note than a big Les Paul, even if you put the same pickups in it. The hollow body model is a way to have the air cavity even bigger and more resonant. But we left a big piece of wood between the top and the back so that when you played really loud, it didn't get away from you. Um, an ES-335 has a big piece of wood down the middle, just like almost a 2x4, and a 330 is completely hollow. One of them feeds back wildly with an amp, and the other one doesn't. So we put a sound post in it, like in a violin, a really big one. I thought that the, there were two of them at the time, a big thick one and a smaller one, and um, uh, a guy in a band called... I'll remember in a minute, started playing the thick one all the time, and I thought that was the winner. But in the end, David Grissom, this guitar player is going to play, played our hollow bodies in the booth for 10 years demonstrating it, and it finally caught on. It's hard to get the market's permission for a new product. It's not so easy, and that was a long, long battle, getting the hollow body to work out. It's one of our models that... If we have them in stock, they sell just like that. It's been that way forever. Um, the Rosa, it just vibrates like crazy when I play it. And is that taking away from the, the length of the note? No. No, the string's driving the body. No, it's alive. It, it, that string shouldn't have enough weight to make that thing vibrate that much. Well, so that's the, the God part. Yeah, that, that's the good part. And when you do the time test, is it just an open string? Or? Yeah, just an open string. Like an A string or a low E. Look, a really good guitar is really bright on the low strings and thick sounding on the high strings. Really bad guitars are really bassy on the low strings and tinny on the high string. There is a vowel note that comes out of a guitar. It, it's oh, oh, e, 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 and it goes e, 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 and some of them sound like dolphins, which is just awful. The best note, in my opinion, is an ah note. Ah, you know, the, and, and listen for the vowel note. Because a wah, you're not, no matter what pickup you put on the guitar, that wah is going to be in the, every note you play. No matter what mic you put on Barbara Streisand, she's not going to sound like Paul Rogers. It isn't going to happen. You need the guitar to sound right and then the pickups to sound right. And the, and the guitars that make an E note where it's choking out, ee, 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 the pickup can't get rid of that. Now you can spend money on a lot of pedals, but it ain't going to work either. Let me try to show you how I think for a minute. This is a good question. If you put old Strat saddles on a 1935 Martin OM, would it sound better or worse? Okay, you think it would sound worse, but you'll put them on your favorite Strat? Ooh. <laughs> Hang on a minute. I'm really making a point here, okay? The reason those saddles on a Stratocaster were invented was not to make it sound good. The reason they were invented was to make the intonation adjustable and the height adjustable. Nobody would ever do it to their best old Martin, ever. They'd never think about it. They know that that bone saddle sounds better. But you'll put it on your favorite electric guitar, 
as if it doesn't make a difference. So my game my whole life has been trying to figure out how to get these industry standard parts to sound good. When I was a kid, if you, stuck, if you had a really good old Strat on the bench and you put the Allen wrench in and you turned it, brown dust came out and you couldn't turn it because it had rusted into place, which means you basically had super glued the whole bridge together. And they sounded great. And when you started changing the parts to new parts out of the, uh, the fender box, it never sounded the same. You know, it's kind of a setup question, but it's true. Nobody would ever put a set of Strat saddles on their old Martin. They just wouldn't do it because it would sound worse. But they'll do it on their favorite guitar. Oh, that's crazy shit. To me, getting the Silver Sky saddles to sound good, really hard. Getting the bridges on David Grissom's guitar to sound good, really hard. One of the things we do is we take a plastic hammer and we'll beat the saddles down so that more of the atoms are touching from the screw is touching the um, bridge like it's been worn in for years and years and years on an old strat when you take the saddles off there's all these marks in the top of the bridge from the from the screws cutting in and it makes the guitar sound better because there's more contact the bone nut thing is industry standard we're doing it more and more and more there's a bone nut on this guitar right here there's a bone nut on the guitar that I have we have a plastic that we use that is full of bronze powder and glass um, that makes it heavier so it sustains the note better. So when you see the black nuts, that's not just a piece of plastic. It's loaded with um, bronze powder. Most nuts and most guitars are made of the same thing you hook your toil to your septic tank with. Does that sound like a good idea to anybody? It's PVC plastic. It's the same thing as the, as the white pipe. It looks like a piece of bone. The only way you're going to be able to find out whether it's actually bone or not is to light it up and smell it or get out a stopwatch. Believe me, it's shutting the guitar down. If I find a really good guitar, I don't want to futz with it. If the guitar's got the stuff, leave it alone. I, I, you know, with some, the worst thing you can do is have a magic guitar and start futzing with it and the magic goes away and you don't understand what happened. I don't know enough about them to give you a good opinion. Um, they're really hard. They're hard to deal with. And they're cool. We put them on the Joe Walsh guitars. And he liked it because the vibrato was so slick. So I don't know enough about it to answer it. And, and I, I just don't have enough experience. I can tell you it's harder to deal with. Yes? Why the wraparound bridge on the Walsh guitar? Because it sounded good. Did you like the way that sounded? Well, I love the way it sounded. Then why, then why, why not? Well, I'm not like, sure. Like, you don't play with a trem. I use my hands or... to bend notes. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> what? Should I show you? No. <laughs> Please. All right, I will. School. You can bet. You, you, did you know that you can play in, in D flat and play in D? I'll show you. Please do. Okay, good. All right, so, yes, because it sounds good. You have a question? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Are you a guitar player? Uh, I'm a keyboard player, actually. He's a guitar player. Okay. <laughs> we'll forgive you. Go on. My question is, um, what's the main difference between a seventeen thousand or thirty thousand guitar versus a two thousand dollar guitar? Is it like the electronics? Is it the uh, wood? Maybe is it like wood that's indigenous from the Amazon or something like that? Like, could you please explain the value? Depends on the maker. It depends on what it is. It there's seventeen thousand dollar vintage guitars that are pieces of junk. There are two thousand dollar vintage guitars that are magic. It depend. It depends. Why don't you come up here and get your hands on this guitar? And I'm telling you that thing is worth every dime I want for it. So that you can, here, I'll get it for you after I've done this demonstration. So you can feel what I believe is an elegant, classy, high level instrument. In my time of dying was played on a Dan Electro. The guitar was made out of fiberboard with a piece of steel, with a piece of Brazilian rosewood on the bridge, and, and it literally no paint on it and, it, and it's that famous tone. I saw him do it live on, the out, uh, uh, on one of his tours, uh, Jimmy Page. I was stunned at the sound coming out of this guitar. So it depends what's the difference between a $2,000 and a $17,000 guitar. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a little bit of work, the dragon, yeah. (laughs) 
All right, let's find out. Do you own, well, let's find out. Do you own a dragon? Yeah, would you like one? Oh, he wants one. <laughs> you own a dragon. I own a dragon. Okay, and why did you buy it? Tell her. Because nothing else in the world plays or sounds like it. What about a 513 of a PRS? I have one of those, too. Okay. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have 29 of Paul's guitar. Oh, wow. wow. Because every one of them is unique, and every one of them is different. So... Your question is not unreasonable. She's barking up the right tree. She just doesn't know because she's a keyboard player. Look, look, you are dead right. Why the hell would I spend $17,000 versus $2,000? And maybe the $2,000 one's better. And I'm telling you to trust your experience. Okay? There's a keyboard in my studio, which was made in 1941 by Hammond, called a Hammond BC, and I've got a tall boy, and it is the best sounding organ anybody has ever heard in their lives, and it was free, because the, because the churches are giving them away, they, to trade in for the piece of plastic you play. I call them pieces of plastic. You have a plastic keyboard, right? I actually have a Hammond instrument. You have a Hammond what? You do. I'm impressed. That's good. good. Do you have a 145 or a 147 with it? You have a 147. Did you know that it was against the law to sell Leslie speaker cabinets at a Hammond dealer? You were not allowed. If you were a Hammond dealer and you carried Leslie, you were fired. Yes, because they wanted to sell their 412 cabinets. Look, I got the organ for free because... The churches are giving them away. They don't know what to do with them. You have a B3. Do you have the carrier and everything? Does she have a carrier? Are you, are you, are you surviving this? Yeah, you're surviving her. Okay, good. You're asking the right question. Ask an expert. The definition of an expert, what time is it? We still have time. The definition of an expert is somebody in a very, very complicated area that solves very, very complicated problems over and over again. By definition, if you need to know whether it's the $2,000 one or the $17,000 one, you can't make up your mind, ask an expert. Now, in my world, when there's two guitars and you want to figure out which one the person wants to buy, you play catch with it. And if they start screaming over one of the guitars when you're playing catch, that's the one they want. It's true. It happened to me. We were in Florida, and this guy goes, I just can't decide if I love this guitar or not. And Jim Greenhill says, back up, Paul. And we started chucking it. And he started screaming. His credit card came out so fast, it was unbelievable. Now, we've done the opposite, and we back up and start throwing it, and the guy has no re or the person has no reaction whatsoever. They don't buy it. This is where I have a problem. There was a guy with a beautiful woman in line, and she was livid angry. And I said, like, what's wrong? He wants another guitar. I said, yeah, the problem. She says, I don't have my wedding ring. In other words, he had spent all the money on all the guitars and never bought her her wedding ring. I threw him out. I threw them out of the PRS experience. They had to go down to the jewelry store and get her a ring. Otherwise, I would never talk to him. That I have a problem with. People actually, you know, make promises and then quietly go buy guitars. I mean, it gets a little out of hand. Do you want to know what all the tricks are that he plays? Okay, you buy all black guitars so you think it's the same guitar. He walks out with an empty case and comes back with a guitar in the case. He brings in a, a bill for $400. He said, look, I only paid 400 bucks for it and didn't tell you that he's traded in a $2,300 guitar on top of it. In the end, you have an experience when you're playing your B3. For a guitar player, it's the same thing. 
And you need to make sure it's going to do its job. It's going to, and, and it's going to be something that's, look, there's something wonderful about guitars. You can't do this with a B3. You can't sit on your couch, play a B3, and put it away, and there's no pain. That's not the way it works. But with a guitar, if you sit on the couch and you play it, and it's beautiful, and you have a good experience, you can put it away, and there's no hangover. It's the best Oxycontin that's ever been invented. There's no hangover. You know what I can't stand? I'm going to, now I'm going to go real deep. This is just good fun. Everybody killed me because the curve on the John Mayer guitar was seven and a half, seven and a quarter inch radius. You can't play solos on a seven and a quarter inch radius. That's not possible. The entire internet went berserk. And I'm sitting there going, I thought Sultan's Swing sounded pretty good. I thought Machine Guns sounded pretty good. I thought the first solo in LaGrange sounded pretty good. You, I mean, it's just nuts. It's just insane. The problem with a seven quarter inch radius is if you don't get the frets dead level, you do have a problem. But if you make the neck dead level and you make the frets dead level, it plays fine. So the 513 was an attempt to make a, a beautiful Swiss Army knife that we could get every sound there was. And at the time, American Idol was huge. And Paul Jackson Jr. needed a guitar to get any tone with any song because the artists were playing different tunes all night long from different artists and, and that was his tool of the trade and at the time that's what was going on um, we've learned how to make 513 sound better and better over time but that was invented by one of our people named Wynn Krozak who runs our place in California and he was an absolutely gifted designer and I let him have the football I like people to hand full thoughts in I don't want to get in the middle of their process so David Grissom, you know, was commanding everything about this DGT, and I did everything he asked me to do. Why would I not do what he asked me to do? He knows what he's doing, right? Why would I get in the middle of it? Wynn knew what he was doing. John Mayer knew what he was doing. Carlos Santana knew what he was doing. John Mayer was more interested in every detail in his guitar than Carlos was in his guitar. But Carlos gives it about 15 seconds or 10 seconds, and he's decided whether he likes it or not. John would give it more time than that. The process is different on every single instrument. I spent three years designing that thing. If you look at it, there's a sunburst on the back of the body to exaggerate the binding. Can you see it? That was not easy to do. Just that little detail. Do you see the sunburst on the bottom of it? Can you see the red turns black before it hits the binding? Those little teeny things make a difference. I was just pointing a detail out to give you an idea. I spent two and a half years on that. Did you ever watch Hendrix play Star Spangled Banner? Do you know what he was doing? He was angry that his friends were dying in Vietnam. He was in the army, right? And they asked him on the Dick Cavett show, how could you do that to that song? He goes, I don't know. I thought it was beautiful. OK. This whole thing about being having a detune mechanism on a guitar is wonderful. But the guitars that I owned when I was young didn't have a detune mechanism, so I figured out how to do it with my hands. And I can show you that now. By the way, a lot of these rock stars are quarter chirping the low notes. They're taking the bass out with their hand because the amp was too bassy. And I can show you how to do that too, so hold on. So you can go. Make it moan by bending the notes, right? There's something beautiful about it. Um, so for me, and David does a lot of this, you can go. You can bend, the thing that's so beautiful about electric guitar is you can bend the notes. And, and it's not just the... Um, uh, one note you can bend, you can bend a whole bunch of them. You can do that with the arm too, right? So for me, I didn't learn how to play with an arm, although I really enjoy it, I'm good at it. Um, I like, uh, and when I uh, recorded Machine Gun, we got permission to record Machine Gun, I used the arm a lot when I did it. 
but it's not typically the way I play. So we do a tune. It's like lifting a little finger off a low D whistle. It's a, it's a Celtic instrument. Um, and it just, uh, just kind of moans, right? You, and, and so you can... And I could have gone... I think it sounds cooler. It's got a little more sass to it, right? Where you go? up a half a step. So when you're playing guitar, you can go, uh, you can go a half step. And it takes a long time to figure out how to, what, how the right notes, but I can tell you that the high strings need to be bent a different distance than the low strings. And there's something very, very cool about a tremolo because it's the detune mechanism. And Jeff Beck will hit two notes. And he'll do. And he can play the tune with the arm. It's genius what this guy had figured out. I mean, what a loss for our industry to lose Tina Turner, to lose Jeff Beck, to lose all these people. We're starting to lose all these geniuses in our business, right? But that's what I was talking about. So, you, you know, you can go... Playing a half step flat. Go spend an hour doing that. That'll warp your head. <laughs> but it's something beautiful about it. And where it came from for me was I went to this Renaissance Music Festival, and this guy had this low D whistle. And every time he lifted his little finger off the low hole on the on the low D whistle, it rocketed through me like a like a like a like a spear. It was it was moaning. It was so cool sounding. So for me. What Jeff does is he pushes down a little bit. Uh, and you can hear him do it all the time, but you can do it with your hands, too. Did I answer your question? Absolutely. Thanks. Are you still crazy as shit? <laughs> Bad, shit. Bad shit crazy. Yes. Trust your experience. If you sit down with a guitar, there's 18 things you can tell that the guitar maker did right, and there's about 18 things you can't tell. You have no idea how you put the trust rod in. You don't know whether she or him put a plastic tube around the neck, around the truss shirt, you don't know anything, but you do know how long it rings, and you do know it feels good in your hands. If the frets are sticking out the side of the neck, that means they didn't dry the fingerboard enough. The frets don't shrink, the fingerboard does. How many people bought a guitar and a year later the frets were sticking out the side of the neck? What I'm suggesting is you use your experience to trust what it is, and you use a stopwatch to figure out how well they, they pick the parts, right? And I'm telling you, there are guitars in, in stores that the nuts aren't glued in. Does that sound a good idea? No. The frets aren't glued in. That's not a good idea. I mean, all kinds of wacky things. It, it's, we call it a guitar-shaped object. It looks like a guitar, but it's not a pro piece of gear. And that's what you want. If you don't know, ask, ask somebody like we were talking about. Ask somebody who does know. This, the reason Cosmos here is because they're full experts. You need people in these departments to be able to explain to you what's going on. It's hard to swim through what's going on right now. People don't know, uh, what, and, you, and trust in what's on the Internet is in some ways great, in some ways not. Um, so it's very, very complicated. So that's kind of my spiel for the day. I wanted to give everybody some take home. Okay, so you've got your hand in the air. I'm trying to... Finish up so David can play Go. All right, no, next. What's, I'm sorry, wait, I'm sorry, go, go on. Wayne Wise, Bruce, and Bobby, 
No, no, I'm sorry. We're going to start over. <laughs> According to the Internet, the only thing that matters is the sound in your hands and the pickups, right? But if that's true, all the wood selecting that the people do for Cremona violins is nuts. I just, I mean, it's, look, drums are acoustic instruments. So everybody admit that other than Simmons drums, or electric drums, a drum is an acoustic instrument? Okay. An electric guitar is an acoustic instrument first. It just happens to have magnetic microphones on it. And the idea that if the wood, let's just exaggerate it. Let's make the body out of balsa wood and let's soak it in water and make the guitar out of that. Is that going to sound good? Of course it makes a difference. My whole career has been based on the fact that it makes a difference. And the idea that it doesn't make a difference is single dimensional thinking. The microphone does make a difference in the tone. The pickup is a magnetic microphone. It absolutely makes a huge difference, okay? We had a problem with one of David's guitars today. The pot wasn't operating quite right. And, and quite frankly, it makes a difference. But don't tell me that all the wood drying we do doesn't make a difference. It does. I've been shot on the internet for so many things. I, we, we got guitar of the year for the NF3. Nobody would buy them. Nobody would sell them. Everybody refused, did not get permission from the market, completely stopped and ended. Until Jimmy Herring picked one up, now you can't find one, okay? Stratocasters were gone until somebody named Jimi Hendrix picked one up. I mean, they were making Jaguars and Jazzmasters and everything else to try to inspire the market to buy. Les Paul was dead till some guy named Slash picked it up. But it's not single dimensional. It's not just the body wood. It's not just the neck wood. It's not just the neck joint. It's not just the neck angle. It's not just how level the fingerboard is. It's not just the nut material, whether you glue it on. It's all these things. Look, in a grocery store, if you run out of cantaloupes, you still have a grocery store, right? But in the guitar world, you run out of guitar cantaloupes, it's over. There's no pickup on a guitar, and a guitar is useless. If you're missing, the guitar is a series event. And then there's a lot of parallel events. You're talking about a parallel event in the guitar that whether the wood's wet or not, what, what kind of resonance it has. I had a choice when I was a young guitar maker. Either I could trust all the old guitar makers and use the woods they used, or I could experiment with all of them. And I didn't have the 10 years to give it, so I trusted all of them. And then I got to go back later and try all the, all the stuff. The neck on that guitar is made out of Pernambuca, which is the wood they use in a violin bow. And I'm sorry, violin bows run what? $200,000, $100,000? Yeah, well, do you think the wood in that thing makes any difference? Nah, the internet says you can just do it with a pedal. I mean, give me a break. I don't buy it. I don't buy that the entire guitar making industry is out of its mind. Woods make a difference in instruments. I just do, I just flat out do. You gotta get the acoustic tone right, then you gotta get the electric tone right, and then you gotta get the whole thing to work together. I picked up a beautiful instrument the other day that was a piece of junk, and I've picked up really ugly instruments that were magic. They just hadn't been, you know, they needed to be scrubbed down and fixed, right? Thank you so much for coming. I hope you guys had a good time. It's a, I told you, Greg, it's a comedy routine, right? All right? I want to explain one thing. I've had so many bad things happen in my life that uh, I make jokes constantly because I've gotten phone calls where your friend wasn't alive anymore. And I don't like it, and so I make fun of everything. That said, this is serious business, because when you're paying money for your guitars, it is serious business. If she spends $17,000 on Dragon, and she doesn't give a shit about the inlay, that's serious business. And whether she buys him a guitar or not today, that's semi-serious business. All right, so thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.